Seems like everybody's interested in time, right? Mm -hmm. So what time is it? Daytime. <laughs> All of us have different ideas, don't we, of what time is. You ask somebody what time it is, and often they'll try to see what that kind of time is. Or you may want to think, well, you know, it's time in the end, or it's time for Jesus to come, or it's time to go to church, or it's time to have a party, or it's some kind of time, right? And people have different ideas on really what time it is. But also we have our expectations, don't we? I mean, we say, how long? How long is it till my birthday? How long is it till Christmas? How long is it till the church gets done? How long is it till... We have all these, don't we? How long? And it's not quite as common as why, <laughs> but it's still a good question, isn't it? How long? Well, the Bible talks about how long 64 times. So evidently, that's an important question there, too. And one of the things would be in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. And if you turn in your Bible to that, because that's one of the really important questions that God wants to answer. Now this is in the opening of the fifth seal, and uh, chapter 6 and verse 10. start with verse 9. The Lamb broke the fifth seal. I saw under the altar souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God, for being faithful in their testimony. These people had died because they would not give up Jesus. And since they would not give up Jesus, people said, we don't need you. You're not helpful to the community. And they killed them. Well, they are talking. How can dead people talk? Well, this is a figure of speech. And Jesus said, well, the stones will cry out. Or, you know, we'll talk to them trees. Those trees will tell you. Well, that's a figure of speech. Anyway, these souls under the altar, why are they under the altar? That's where the prayers are sent up. It's the altar of incense, and that's where prayers go up. The question they're asking is, how long, sovereign Lord, O holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us. So who are you? Are you people of this world? Is the question being pointed to you? I would hope not. There's the people of God, and there's the people of this world. And the question is, well, how long until they're judged? Well, is it a good thing to be judged? Well, in the Bible, there's two kinds of judgment. A judgment for God and a judgment for destruction. And if you're judged for God, that means you get eternal life. And if you're judged as being a part of the world, you get destruction, eternal death. So that is a question. How long? And that's a question people are asking. How long, God? I mean, we've had this good and evil for quite a number of years, and now I want to know, well, how long till you wrap it up? How long till we come to the end? How long do we have to work at these things here on this earth until you finally come and make all things new again? Let's turn to Daniel chapter 8, shall we? Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, and we'll start with verse 13. Then I heard two holy ones talking to each other. One of them asked, How long will the events of this vision last? How long will the rebellion that causes destruction stop the daily sacrifices? How long will the temple and heaven's army be trampled on? Three questions, how long? We want to know how long is evil going to continue? How long is this wickedness going to prevail? When will God finally take care of evil? 
Well, that's the answer that Paul spoke in his reading of Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. There's also lots of other questions, and I'm not going to read all 64 of these how long questions in the Bible, but let me just briefly go over some. In Psalms especially, that has more how long questions than any other book of the Bible. How long will the people ruin my reputation? Can you think of that? How long is God going to ruin my reputation? No. How long are we going to ruin God's reputation? Why? What are we doing? Well, not always what God wants us to do. And we're God's people. And can we be ruining His because we represent Christ, or at least we claim to? Well, there's other questions. How long until you restore me? How long will you forget me? How long will you look and do nothing? How long must I wait? I'll suffer. How long must I wait to go swimming? How long must I wait? All kinds of questions. But in Psalms 119.84, how long must I wait? How long will your anger burn like fire? How long will you delay? How long will you, until you again show mercy? Well, then there's the other question about time. The word time itself. Is that used in the Bible at all? Can you think of any verses at all using the word time? Well, there's a thousand and seventy-seven of them, so yeah, I suppose there's quite a few, right? Well, there's a time of testing. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3, start with verse, no, verse 8. Talking about the Philadelphia church, remember there's messages to seven of these churches in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8 talks about the Philadelphia church. And Jesus says, I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Now here is what I want you to pay attention to. Verse 10. Because you have obeyed my command to what? Persevere. I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Okay. Who's going to be tested? Good people or bad people? What does the Bible say? Let's read it again. I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Do we belong to this world? No. Hmm. Time of testing is going to fall on those who belong to this world. If we don't belong to this world, then we won't have that time of testing. Is that contrary to what you've always believed? No. Maybe. Depends on what you believed, right? Well, God doesn't want to. He knows his people. Does he have to test them? Well, he strengthens his people. He allows them opportunity to grow their faith. But does he have to test them to know if they love him or not? No. He only tests those who belong to this world. And the point of that is to show what they really are like to themselves. So that they will know that they are short and not ready for Jesus. Jesus then says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Is that important? Time of testing? It kind of separates those who think the world is most important and those who think God is most important in this world. And you think, well, of course I think God is most important. Well, if so, then how much time do we spend with Him compared to the time we spend loving the world? Now, I'm not going to get into a bunch of specifics, but I certainly could. Time loving the world? Oh, yeah. What's the priority on Sunday? What's the priority on Monday? What's the priority on Wednesday? What's the priority on Friday night? That's a question that you need 
to ask yourselves. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Revelation 14, and verse 7 says this. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. The time has come. God's going to sit as judge. And what is he going to judge? We just talked about that. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. We know where our worship needs to go. And the time has come when finally God is going to judge. Well, the question is, was, when he opened the fifth seal, how long till you judge those people? And we know the testing time comes to those people who are of this world and God is going to judge them. And the time has come for God to judge. And when God judges, then the end can come. Right? God judges, now there's a separation. Those who have chosen evil, those who have chosen God, they're separate. And then in the very, oh, moving on down to verse 15. You have, when God judges, then you have the time of the harvest. Then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come. So then God judges, then he can harvest, and there's going to be a separation of the wheat and the chaff, the sheep and the goats, the good and the evil, those on the right hand, those on the left hand. God is going to judge. And the time has come for that. Now let's go to Revelation 11:18, and let's help Tom out and figure out what this is all about. 11:18 is finding a very interesting verse. It's kind of a long verse, but it is a summary verse of everything that happens after this. The nations were filled with wrath. But now the time for your wrath has come. Whose wrath is that? God's wrath. Now we think, well, wrath means anger, right? God's going to get angry and look out. When somebody gets angry, they often make bad decisions, right? Wrong. <laughs> when God's wrath has come, God is finally going to say all of those who are a part of this world are finally going to get what they want, what they deserve. They have rejected God for so long. God created this world to be a place of harmony, to be a place of peace, and they have rejected that and made it a world of violence, of destruction, and now they're going to get what they have brought upon themselves. So. It's time for your wrath, God's wrath, to come. It's time to judge the dead. Reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people, and all who fear your name. <coughs> so he's going to judge the dead. Now, what does judging the dead mean? And you think, well, dead, I mean, people who are not alive, right? No, not necessarily. The dead who are dead to Christ, who have nothing to do with Christ, they are judged. People of this world, people who serve this world, who love this world, whose priority is this world, they are going to be judged. And what is else is going on? Rewards. The reward, the servants, your prophets, and your holy people, and those who fear your name. So, judge the people who are dead to Christ, who have nothing to do with Christ, and reward these other three groups. The prophets, holy people, those who fear your name, from the least to the greatest. And the final thing, it's time to destroy those who have caused destruction on the earth. Okay, you said that's a summary. Now, what is the other part of it. Revelation 11:18. the first part says, 
The nations were filled with wrath. You find that in Revelation chapter 12, the very next chapter. And let's look specifically at uh, verse 17. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments, <coughs> and maintain their testimony for Jesus. So the devil is angry, and God has his wrath, and there's a war going on. Do you think God likes what devil is doing? Do you think the devil likes what God is doing? No, that's definitely cause for war. The dragon took his stand. Well, Revelation 11, 18, 12, 13, and 14 talk about that war. Talk about the anger. Talking about what is going to happen, that war going on. Now, Revelation 11, 18 then talks about the time of God's wrath. And that's in chapters 15, 16, 17, and 18. His wrath dealing with these seven plagues that are going to happen. God's wrath. And God's wrath is this time of testing. Testing to see whether people of the world, people who love the world, will actually change their mind and decide, well, maybe I ought to serve God after all. As we go through the plagues, you'll find that they don't. They are so secure in loving the world that they won't change, even though it would be to their benefit to change their mind. So Revelation 15, verse 1 is a good uh, summary statement. Then I saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which brings God's wrath to completion. So when God does these seven plagues, it's all over. It's done. No more of God's wrath. And then eternity of peace can happen. It also talks about it's time to judge the dead. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 says this. Um, let's start with 11, kind of get opening and uh, getting up to that. And I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, and they had no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, the death and grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. And the dead, death and grave were thrown into the lake of fire. No more death, no more grave after that. They were judged. And who was judged? All the dead according to their deeds. Well, you know a person by what they do. <coughs> not just what they say or just what they claim it's their actions that prove where they really are then the next part of that Revelation 11 18 says he's going to reward his servants <coughs> well Revelation chapter 21 Revelation chapter 2 spells out all the rewards for his servants and remember it's not just servants it's the prophets and the holy ones well, Revelation 22, 12, that's, that's a nice summary statement. Uh, Revelation 22 and verse 12 says this. Look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. On the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Well, that's what Jesus is about. He's going to reward his servants. And then the final part of that, Revelation 11, 18 says, there's going to be a time to destroy. Thank you very much. A time just to destroy. Now we think, well, God's so loving, why would he destroy anything? 
Well, if a doctor is so loving, why would he want to destroy cancer? If a doctor is so loving, why would he want to de destroy disease? Well, God needs to destroy the cancer of sin because it spreads like wildfire. And he's going to destroy the disease of sin as well. So he's going to destroy in Revelation 19, verse 2. Revelation 19, verse 2 says this. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who has corrupted the earth with his, her immorality. He has avenged the murder of his servants. Oh, that sounds like Revelation 6. The question of the people under the altar from the fifth seal, how long till you avenge us? Well, there it is in Revelation chapter 19. It is fulfilled. He has avenged the murder of his servants. Well, God says that all of this is for a purpose, to make this world whole again. Very next verse, right after Revelation 11, 18, has an interesting significance, and that is verse 19. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened, and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. What? After all of this, all the things God is acting, and all of a sudden, we see in heaven the Ark of the Covenant. It's all about salvation. That's what the Ark of the Covenant has always been about. And you see all of this, and it is, sounds kind of awful, you know, the destruction, the war between God and Satan, but it's all about God saving his people. That's what it's about. You see the Ark of the Covenant, you see salvation, you see God's mercy, and all of a sudden, that's the purpose of the seven last plagues. That's the purpose of this time of testing. That's the purpose of all this, how long God is waiting for the right time so that all can have the opportunity to make their choice. Then it says, lightning flash, thunder crashed and roared, and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. God loves dramatic effects, doesn't he? Mount Sinai, you have all of this stuff. And whenever God speaks, it thunders, and you have lightning in many, many places in the Old Testament. i got quite a list of them. I'm not going to list them for you right now. But whenever God speaks, whenever God has some dramatic action, when God wants to get your attention, thunder happens, lightning happens, hailstones, uh, storms happen. In fact, in uh, Isaiah 29.6, Isaiah 29.6 is a very good summary statement that kind of tells why he does all of this. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 6 says this. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, will act for you with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and storm and consuming fire. God is acting for for you. That's what he's doing. It's not to just bring attention to himself. No, he's doing this for your salvation. That's what he's up to. And all through Revelation, that's what it's about. He is acting to save his people. But he has to be very careful that he separates the wheat from the chaff, the good from the evil. Because who wants to think in their mind, God didn't get it right? That's what the thousand years in heaven are for. To understand all of God's actions. And so we know and understand and have confidence that yes, God did get it right. Through all these acts in the book of Revelation. Well, then we have Revelation chapter 12. Right after Revelation 11, 18, 19. Then we have Revelation 12 where he talks about the woman and the dragon. And that is basically the great controversy theme. Well, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And we'll be coming to that, and we'll be reading about that here shortly in our Sabbath school lesson, but I want to refer it, you to it right now. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That's what he's doing. He wants people to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. But they will if they choose to be because he will allow them their decision. 
Remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with wisdom God gave him. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And also, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 says this, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. People will do that? Oh, most definitely in the last times. The devil is pretty persuasive. He loves to deceive people and he has deceived an awful lot of people. Well, God gave the message at the right time. At just the right time, Christ will be revealed and that's uh, talked about in 1 Timothy. And in the last days, it will be difficult times. So all the more reason why we need to stay close to God. To know what His Scriptures are saying. And to know and have confidence in His Word. Because God promised to save us. And He will. We've got to stick with Him. We can't be following the ways of the world. We can't be going after every whim everybody comes up with. We've got to follow Scripture. Well, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, the time has come for judgment. And judgment is good news because finally sin will be taken care of. You are going to be lifted up. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, at the right time, He will lift you up. Instead of being the scourge of the world, those who follow Christ seem to be the scourge of the world. No, at the right time, He will lift you up. And that text, God's patience gives people time to be saved. So, how long? Yeah, wait a little longer. God is working to save. That's what it's all about. He's just not trying to make us frustrated. He's not trying to see how many nasty things he can get us to put up with. No. He's working to save as many people as he can. Amen. So, hang in there. God wants to save as many as possible. Perseverance is the key. And the time has come for that to happen. Let's pray. Dear Father, open up our hearts to your word. Open up our hearts to your timing. And Father, let us look at your judgment with awe and anticipation because that's when you judge your people worthy to be saved, worthy to spend eternity with you. And Father, that's also when you judge that those who have refused you will finally be destroyed. Oh Father, may we be faithful in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's close.